to the book of Psalms, chapter 49. Psalms, chapter 49. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom and of meditation of my heart. And uh, there shall be understanding. I'm going to stop right there just a moment. And um, I don't want you to see some things here. He's saying something to all of us. We're all of us in the world, right? And so when you read a verse like this and it says, All ye people give ear. He's saying it's important for all of us to tune in, to listen to this. Uh, when, when the Lord says something like this, we'll read the Scripture always and we're to listen to it and we're to try to gain something from the Scripture every time we read the Scripture. But when He points it out and says, listen now, all you people, I want you to get something. And so what He's saying, this is very important for us. And so He said, my mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Now this man, he's writing here, and uh, we're not 100% sure who wrote this particular psalm, but he is saying, I've got some wisdom that didn't come from myself. This is something that came to me from the Lord, and it's for your benefit. Uh, the writers of Scripture knew that they were being directed by the Holy Spirit in everything they wrote down. And the holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the Word of God was given to them, and they knew. Now, sometimes they didn't understand when they spoke of coming events what they were uh, talking about. In fact, it's very interesting that the book of uh, James says that they didn't understand some of the things that they were telling of others, but they were going to happen anyway, whether they understood it or not. And then upon us, whom the ends of the world to come, we have more understanding because we can see these things coming to pass. As an example, when these things were written, uh, there was nothing said about uh, the uh, nation Israel ever gathering back into the land in unbelief. And, uh, and so, uh, if someone would catch the door there, please. Uh, and so, uh, we don't uh, understand that. And uh, we don't understand when he said it was going to happen, and then it happened. Well, we understand it now. They didn't understand it when it was written, but we understand it because it's seen, it, we've actually seen it happen in our lives. You, we actually have seen the fulfillment of these things, of them coming back into Jerusalem, making Jerusalem now the capital of uh, Israel, all that. We've actually seen that in our lifetime. And so we're seeing fulfillment of prophecy. We know that things are going to happen. I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. Now he said, I'm going to speak to you in a parable, but I'm going to listen to it. And the idea is here like a musician listens to the sound of the instrument, especially here he's speaking of a harp. And when uh, the musician would play the harp, he'd listen to that tone to make sure that everything was just exactly in tune. And so he said, I've tuned in to a parable, but he said, I want you to understand. Uh, and even though these are dark sayings, I'm going to open them up. I want to help you to understand these things. I want you to have understanding of spiritual truth. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I, I want you to be filled with a knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might uh, unto all patience and endurance uh, with faith. You know, He's saying to us, it's very important that we get from the Word that strength that we need to live as we ought to live. Now He's talking to us. Those first four verses are kind of introductory. And now I'm going to look at verse 5. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil? It's interesting that this expression, days of evil, occurs over in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 1. Some of you memorized that verse where it said about, uh, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not. Now, he's talking about our old age. 
Now, I know I'm speaking over the head of most of you, but <laughs> did you know that he is addressing this to us? And, and most of us here are over 50 in a way, and uh, some are over 60 and 70 and 80 and nearly 90, <laughs> no, over 90. And, uh, and so he's talking to us. And he is saying these evil days are going to come. Are they talking about the days when we become weaker in body, uh, when we need hearing aids, when we need uh, glasses more than never before, when we have uh, extra teeth, you know, that we bought at the store. And um, I had a preacher friend, i got to tell you this, I had a preacher friend many years ago, and he had teeth that were just really rough. They were buck teeth, you know, and they looked really bad. And, uh, and it, you know, he just overcame that and, and became a good gospel preacher. Somebody, one day a person asked him, he said, Brother Bobby, are those your teeth? Are those your real teeth? And he smiled and he said, you don't think I'd pay for something to look like this, do you? <laughs> Uh, that was Brother Bobby. Uh, but, uh, you know, we all are going to that place. We're heading toward our end destination in this world. And he speaks that to us. And, and those evil days are coming when we're going to have more bodily pains. We're going to have more aches. We're going to have uh, more lumbago and arthritis and all of that other stuff that comes on us. It's going to happen. It's a part of growing old. And so he says of it, uh, why should I fear the days of evil and the days of evil? Do we have any reason to fear that anything that could happen to us well, should knock us out of the race? No. No, these things are going to happen. And we ought to be aware of them, but we ought to be so aware that we will not, we refuse to let these things keep us from serving the Lord and doing the things that we ought to do. Amen. We have to overcome it. And now, as we get older, it takes a little more effort because it's so much easier to sit in that easy chair and uh, not get up and go to church. Nobody here. But uh, it's easier to do that than it is to get up and force yourself to go. But we know that we're not to forsake assembling of ourselves together, and we know it's where we ought to be, and so that's where we go because that's what we ought to do. I believe we ought to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I believe it takes three to thrive in the Christian life, and I believe he ought to be there uh, in every service. And he said, Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? Now, this is an interesting expression here. When the iniquity of my heels, that is, uh, when you think about the heel, that's where you step, and uh, you think about the past, and you think about the mistakes that you've made, and you think about uh, how you stubbed your toe spiritually, and uh, you think of the times that you have not been what you ought to be for the Lord, and you look back, and you think, boy, didn't I make a mess out of things there? And uh, the iniquity of our heels is catching up with us. But he's also teaching us something here. He was saying to us that we ought not to let that bother us. We ought to do as the Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is we must not allow the past to destroy the present. We must not let it take away our joy and anticipation of the future. Everything is bright to the child of God. Our future is bright. And we must not let any of the things of the past destroy us. We use them as stepping stones rather than stumbling blocks. And so he said, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. What is he saying here? What he's saying is, when we look at the people around us, we see the low 
and the high. We see the rich and the poor. And God gives his word to all of us. And there is no difference in the sight of God whether you've been blessed with money or whether you don't have any. Or if you are struggling or if you're financially able. It, it makes no difference. God doesn't look at you and say, well, I'm going to have more pity on you because you're poor or I'm going to bless you more because you're rich. God loves you. He says, I love all of you the same. We're all in this together. We're in this business of living for God and seeing what God can do in our lives. Rich or poor makes no difference. Low or high and uh, rich or poor makes no difference at all. God is no respecter of persons. God does not look at people and say, well, I think I ought to bless them because they have a few dollars. You know, the book of James warns us about that. In the book of James, he says, now, I'm telling you people, you're, doing, you're making a bad mistake. You're wrong in this matter. Because some of the people come into your congregation and uh, they are wearing vine clothes uh, these heart chapter and Mark's clothes and, you know, these floor sign shoes and all this. And, boy, they're all dressed up. And you honor them and you bring them in and give them the high seats in the church. And then someone poor comes in and he's in raggedy clothes and, and he smells bad because he hadn't had a bath. And you put him in the back, way over back yonder over there somewhere. He said, these things ought not so to be. God is no respecter of persons. We ought to have the same concern for every person. It makes no difference. And uh, the true Christian, the one that has the heart of Jesus in him, looks at everybody and loves everyone and realizes Jesus died for every one of them. Uh, just uh, on, I think it was Saturday, I was at the hospital for about five hours, six hours uh, with, uh, with Judy. And... Uh, I sat there and watched people come and go and come and go and come and go. And my heart, I, I, I was just broken. I said, look at all these people from different strata. You could tell some of them are very poor. Some of them are very wealthy. You could tell by the rings on their fingers and their clothes and all this. And I looked at them and I said, you know, Jesus died for every single one of those people. For every one of them. The, the heart of Jesus is for everybody. And I prayed for them. I said, oh, Lord, that they might know the Savior. That they might be saved. And uh, this ought to be the heart of every child of God. Now, he is saying here, here's a rich man, and he thinks because he's wealthy that he can redeem his brother so that his brother wouldn't die. That he can somehow ransom him and keep him from ever dying. Now, can that happen? For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. He, he wants to pay, and he's trying to make a bargain with God. And uh, no one, hear me, no one can bargain with God. You can't bargain. You've got to come and do God's way. And uh, I've had people that talk to me about this. Well, I believe if I do this, that God will do this. And I can kind of, I, I, I've had people say, well, I, me and the Lord, we have our own business between us. And I said, well, that's a shame because it's contrary to this book. And you must be a different God than the one in this book. The God that you're dealing with is not the God of this book. Because you can't bargain with him. You must come his way and his way only. He didn't say Jesus is a way. He said Jesus is the way. He's not one among many ways. He is the way. There is no other way. And he says the redemption of their soul is precious. It ceases forever. He said, you know, it, what it would cost to redeem a human soul is more than you ever could pay. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much wealth you have, you could never pay for salvation. It is too precious. Now, the Bible tells us we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. The only thing that could purchase our souls is the blood of Christ. Now, there are some people who started a false doctrine that you could pray for people after they died. And that's totally contrary to the Bible. And you go, you pray some, for somebody after they've died, and you can even pray them out of uh, uh, purgatory, which is not in the Bible, and, and, uh, and try to get them into heaven. 
And usually they have to pay the priest a whole lot of money to do that. And that's all phony and false and wrong and it's wicked. It's a contrary doctrine. It's a false gospel. That's what this book says. Now you say, you shouldn't be so hard, preacher. You should just kind of be tolerant of everybody, you know, and just say, well, God has a way and he'll make a way. No, no. The apostle Paul said, if anybody preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preach unto you, let him be accursed. Let him come under the wrath of God. Because God has his plan of salvation and anything else is contrary to God's way of salvation. And so he said, you can't pray them out. You can't pay them out. There's just no way you can't redeem them no matter how much money you have with all of your money. Now look at uh, uh, verse uh, number 11. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own name. Isn't that interesting? And we have seen so much of that in our day. And it's, it's actually, it's kind of comical. People believe somehow in their own inward thoughts that they are going to live and live and live. And they don't even like to think about dying. And this chapter brings it right before us. We can't avoid it. And, and there's some people, though, think that because they have money, if they get sick, they can pay a doctor. And if they uh, have a, a bad sickness, they can find a better hospital and they can go to this one or that one. Or, and they're going to live forever. And then they name their lands after their own name. This estate and that estate and this estate. I heard of, uh, of one who named his uh, state after himself. And something about this man uh, he, he was driving in his limousine. He had his driver in a big black limousine. He's riding in it. And, and as it goes along, they see a man uh, pull on the side of the road the hood up on his car. And he's in there looking around. And so he tells his driver, pull up in there behind him. And he gets out, and he's dressed to the nines. I mean, all the tie and all that business. And he walks up to the fellow, and he says, uh, can I help you somehow? And the fellow says, yes, I, I, maybe you can. He said, uh, it's kind of surprising me that you would stop and, and help me. But he said, I, can, I think I can fix it. If you just get in the car, and uh, when I tell you, try to start it. And I'm going to make some adjustments. He said, okay. So the rich fellow gets in the car. And finally, after he tinkers it with it a little bit, he said, okay, try it. He cranked it. Boy, that thing cranked right up. Man, he, <laughs> so glad and so happy. So he gets out, and he starts to go back. And the fellow stops. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, how is it that you, being such a rich man as you are, obviously, he said, how is it you would stop and help me? Well, he said, uh, I'm Henry Ford, and I don't like to see one of my vehicles <laughs> parked on the side of the road. <laughs> A true story. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, rich people, no matter how rich they are, can't buy their way into heaven, nor can they get anybody else into heaven. And, and so he says here, he said, you can name your state the Ford Estate, and you can name all the states and all your lands and name it after yourself, but that's not going to get you from the that day is coming. It's not going to keep you from that day that's appointed to you. Because, he said, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after death, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. I mean, it's just as clear as it possibly can be. It's appointed. And every person here has that appointment. And none of us really want that appointment today. But I guarantee you, the closer we get to it and the older we get, the more we think about the glory of heaven and thinking about the street of gold and all the glory and the tree of life and the water of life and no more sickness or pain or death. Ah, oh, you know, the, it kind of looks more and more inviting all the time. And we think, well, boy, it's going to be a wonderful thing. And so many of our friends and loved ones are already there. Right after service this morning... I uh, checked my email, and I, I got a note on my phone. My brother Jim, who's been here several times through the last 20 years or so, 
He said, uh, my wife passed away this morning. And uh, it, it just broke my heart. I, I said, what? We vacationed with them uh, last year. We went up to the, to the ark and uh, enjoyed seeing the ark with them. And uh, we, we rented a cabin and stayed up there. And um, they were here in the spring. And while they were here, I opened the Bible and I said to her, Vi, do you know for sure if you die today, you'd go to heaven? And she said, no, I sure don't. And I said, you know, you're in good health and everything you seem to have, no problem whatsoever. But you know, there is a day appointed. We all have an appointment. Could I show you how you can know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? She said, yes. And so I took my faithful little green book and uh, I said, uh, let me show you. And I showed her the plan of salvation, and she just sweetly asked Jesus to come into her life and be her Savior. And now she's already on this other side. She, had, she got pneumonia. Went to the hospital, double pneumonia, and went downhill and passed away this morning. And it's so sad, and I thought, my, but we don't know how soon our appointment is. The psalm said, teach me to number my days, for I don't know the number of them. And so he said, nevertheless, man being at honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. No matter how, how much honor he has, no matter how much money he has, that's not going to keep him from this day of, that's appointed for him. And he said, this their way is their folly. Yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah, think of that. Even though it's folly, and they live as if they're never going to die, and they don't prepare for eternity, yet their posterity say, hey, he's making money. <laughs> and you know what? We're going to inherit it. And so they approve of it. And they don't worry about whether the man's ready to die or not. Because they can see dollar signs. And so he said, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. The picture is very vivid, is it not? They die and they're put in the grave. And corruption sets in. Now, several years ago, I uh, had the opportunity to go to work for a cemetery company, uh, the Service Corporation International, which was out of, out of uh, Fort Worth, or out of um, Houston, Texas. And uh, so they sent me down there and sent me through training and all that business. And I was in evangelism, but I was making extra money on the side between revivals. And, uh, and so I went to work for this company. And uh, they deal in death. That was the whole thing. That was, that was their business. And, uh, and so it was my privilege, opportunity, duty. Sometimes we had to exhume somebody. Not a pleasant thing when you wrap all that around the grave and bring it up. And uh, no matter how good the casket is, it doesn't keep them from decaying. Corruption sets in and uh, the odor is horrible. And we have people who spend literally thousands upon thousands of dollars and uh, they will buy mausoleums and think that that will keep them. It doesn't. It doesn't do it. And uh, I had occasion uh, to, to meet with a couple and, and this couple had no relatives whatsoever and uh, so I talked to them about uh, what they would like to have and they said, we want a mausoleum. Oh, well, okay, you sure? That's what you, yeah, that's what we want. So I fixed them up with a 
side by side mausoleum. They wanted uh, uh, the uh, plaques on there. That was a you know, that brass thing, and that's real expensive stuff. And they wanted that. And then I said, well, we're just going to put them in the mausoleum. What kind of a casket do you want? We want the best thing you got. I sold them bronze caskets, $25,000 worth of stuff. This was years ago because they had all the money and nobody to give it to. And so they said, we're going to spend it on ourselves, and we're going to go out in fashion. But you know what? No matter how much they spent, that had not one iota to do with their soul. They put it with themselves in great fashion, but that certainly did not affect their soul. They still are going to decay in the grave. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, or he shall receive me. Think of that. Now he's saying there's a difference. There's a difference between those who know Christ as Savior and those who do not. And those who know the Savior, hey, we don't worry about dying. In fact, death kind of looks good sometimes, you know. And, and we're going to be going to be with the Lord, and, uh, and all is well. When my father came to die, he'd lived for God faithfully for so many years came to time, and, and, uh, and they told him, they said, look, you have cancer uh, in your kidneys, and uh, we need to put you on dialysis. Uh, and he said, well, what's the purpose? He said, well, we can get you about three more months. And he was past the age when they could do any good for him. He had emphysema. And he said, well, why? He said, I don't want that. He said, you know, well, you're, you're going to die without it. He said, well, that's okay. I'm just going to go with Jesus. That's all right. And why should I have a dialysis and spend me three more months of suffering when I can be walking on the streets of glory. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, he called me together. We had prayer together and, and his wife got close and she said, it's okay. It's okay, Strick. Be with Jesus. Go with Jesus. And he just went on out to heaven. Ah, oh, he's so good when you know the Lord. When you know Christ and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Paul the Apostle said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, it's to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your joy and uh, for the continuance of your faith. Now watch what he said. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich and the glory of his house increaseth. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. I think that's been said many, many times, but uh, it is true, and you know it's true, uh, that uh, you can't take anything with you. When you leave, you came into this world without anything, and you're going to go out of this world without anything. And uh, everyone has heard the stories, and there's little jokes that people tell uh, about, uh, for instance, this very wealthy man who was uh, a member of the mafia, and he, and he told his wife, he said, you know, when I die, let him put all the money in the casket and all that business because that'll help pay for my soul. And so uh, he, uh, he died, and uh, his uh, wife came to the, she wanted to be the last one to see him. She was the last one to see him, and, and uh, then she left. And someone said to her, well, what, 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 why did you do that? And he said, I wanted to make sure that all that money was taken care of, so I took it out and wrote a check. And uh, we all hear the stories. And, uh, you know, you've heard the statement that you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. You can't take it with you when you go. You just can't do it. And, and there was a fellow in Texas, a wealthy oil man, who in his uh, last dying moments and all, he said, here's what I want. I want to be buried in a gold Cadillac. I want to be buried in a gold Cadillac. And so these people uh, acquiesced to his desires, and they had a Cadillac gold-plated, and they put him on the front seat of this gold Cadillac, and they had this enormous hole, and they had a crane, and uh, as they were putting him down, everybody could stand and see him in, uh, they had raised the seat up in the front where everybody could see him through the windshield, 
And there was two young men standing there, and one said to the other, Man, that's living. <laughs> you see, people have the wrong idea about death. That's not living. And this fellow who has all this money and dies without Christ, he is of all men most miserable. Most miserable. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. Now he's a man who had wealth and he uh, used that wealth for himself. And he blessed himself and he bought houses and land and all the rest of it. And he blessed himself and he said, you know, people will actually speak well of you if you bless yourself like that. Has nothing to do with his soul. Has nothing to do at all with life after death. It has nothing to do with the fact that there's judgment after death, the judgment. But people still speak well. I sometimes dread going to a funeral if I didn't know the person knew Christ as his Savior. And I dread to hear a preacher get up and they say, well, he's gone to a better place. No, he hasn't gone to a better place. If he's not a Christian, he's gone to the worst possible place. He's in hell. I mean, Jesus said about the rich man, he died, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. I mean, it's instant. There's a way to keep out of hell, but there's no way to get out. And so here he is. And uh, the sad thing is that people will say that. And no matter who it is that dies, well, they were such a good person. And then I've had even people say, well, if anybody made it to heaven, they did. Thinking about their own goodness and how, how they treated other people. And, and uh, one, some of us, I was baptized. They were baptized when they were a baby, so they probably went to heaven. And that has nothing whatsoever to do it. That just got them wet. Just got the body wet. Has nothing to do with your salvation. Nothing in the Bible about that. That's foolishness. Look, the only way to heaven is Jesus. And a person has to come to Christ and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I am. I need you. You died for me. You bought my salvation. I receive you as my Savior. That's the only possible way to heaven. And so, while he lived... He blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. I dread to hear it when I hear people talk about how good a person was. Oh, he was a good man. He cursed God and lived like the devil and cheated on his wife. and all. But he was a good man. You know, he had a good heart. He was a sincere person. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and said, I'm tormented in this flame. I'll tell you, folk, people need Jesus. Amen. There is no other way. This is it. And so notice what he said. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. The Bible speaks of hell as a place of outer darkness where the darkness is like the darkness that came over Egypt. It was so dark that you could feel it. I've mentioned to you when uh, I was down in uh, Ruby Falls with, uh, with a group that had come to visit, and I took them up there. I was living near Chattanooga. Went down in Ruby Falls. We got down in the very bottom, and the lights went out. It was so black you could not see. I deliberately put my hand close to my face as I could. I could not see my own hand. It was black. And I thought, that's what the Bible says about hell. It's outer darkness. Suffering and pain and blackness and loneliness. Outer darkness. They shall never see light. Now there's a finality to it. Did you see it? Once they're there, they'll never see light. There's not a time ever in eternity that'll ever change. They shall never see light. Oh, the sadness of dying without Christ. 
the sadness of leaving this world without the Savior. My, we need to do all we can to reach people for Christ. We need to do what we can, support missions, get the message out to everybody, do what we can in our area, our local area, get the message of Christ and his salvation to every soul. It's our responsibility, folk. And then he said, man that is in honor and understandeth not. Talking about not understanding salvation through Christ, not understanding the way of God, is like the beasts that perish. He goes to the grave just like an animal. He, you don't see that animal. His body's decayed and it's over. He's gone. And in his soul lasts forever. I think someone said it uh, the best. Uh, it's all about location. Everybody is going to die. It's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. And so it's not a question of whether if we're going to die. Let's face it. It's an unhappy prospect. I'd like to live for another 10, 15 years, would you? Yeah. Oh, Zadie says, no, I want to get to heaven. <laughs> and, uh, but most of us would like to, to live a little longer. Hezekiah is the only one I've ever known of that was guaranteed any time in this world. You know, he was ready to die, and he prayed, and uh, they sent the message to him. I think it was Isaiah came to him and said, God's heard your prayer, and he's going to give you 15 more years. The only one I know of, preacher, that had a promise of tomorrow. He had 15 years promised. We don't have 15 minutes. We better be ready. Know the Savior. Put your confidence in Jesus. Live for Jesus. And let's help as many people as we can to know him as Savior. Let's pray.